Hello and welcome to the ninth episode in our series, The Evolution of a Nation, a documentary series chronicling Uganda's key political, social and economic events since 1944, Ambat Kakoza. In the eighth episode, we focused on the events of the 1966 Uganda crisis. In this episode, we look at Obote's socialist policy, attempts on his life and the 1971 Idi Amin's coup. Thanks for joining us. In June 1968, the Annual Delegates Conference of Uganda People's Congress passed a resolution to move ideologically and practically to the left, and in June the following year, the party adopted the guiding document that was named the Common Man's Charter. The policy aimed at promoting classical socialist ideals such as workers' ownership of the means of production. We see that at the expiry of the first five-year development plan, the first five-year post-independence development plan. Now the UPC had to design another one, and the uh, the left and both the, the centrist were in charge. Uh, so they designed that uh, uh, common man's charter, uh, which of course was attacking feudalism, feudalism as an archaic institution that favors the privileged, and for them they wanted a system that favors the common person, the common man, um, uh, uh, instead of controlling uh, a few individuals, private individuals, controlling the resources and being powerful capitalists. <coughs> they were looking at the state, uh, uh, the state commanding the, 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 the heights of the economy, <coughs> So you find that in the Common Man's Charter, there was this concept of nationalization uh, of institutions, of government parastatals. The government becomes more and more involved in the control and management of the economy. Uh, and, uh, of course, there was another one. They proposed the national service. Uh, but I must say all those did not think very well into the population. So that was a time of uh, of, uh, mm, of isms, yeah. communism, capitalism, socialism, and so on. And uh, there was a fascination uh, within the African continent of uh, a midway approach between communism and uh, and capitalism, and that was socialism, an attempt. To, to appear and to move uh, towards socialism. On the African continent, Obote was one of those leaders who were categorized as one of the progressives or nationalist leaders. So he had to come up with a program at home um, that would associate him with the leaders like the uh, Nkurumas. One thing, though, that um, on many occasions and in many instances, uh, Obote talked one language, acted the opposite language in many, many cases. How can you have a socialist pro program without people who believe in socialism? He brought it up after we had been expelled from the party. Those of, of us who had helped to put up a systematic socialist system had been expelled from the party. And here comes a bolt from the blue, a document of, <laughs> of, 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 of socialism. Therefore, it could, not have, it could not have worked. Now, this move immediately alienated Western powers who feared that Uganda, like some other newly independent African countries, would form a strong alliance with the Soviet Union. But in the actual fact, Obote's policies were a diluted form of socialism that sought substantial but not majority shareholding in foreign-owned businesses. 
not the full-scale nationalization that was feared. Nevertheless, Obote was seen by Western countries as a kind of socialist ogre of emerging independent Africa, the perception that was later to contribute to his problems. Obote continued uh, with Nyerere, with other leaders like Kaunda, to engage the West, the capitalists, the former colonial powers. Uh, they continued supporting uh, liberation movements. Uh, for example, they were engaging Britain for arming South Africa, apartheid regime, uh, and uh, support for uh, the, the, the Arabs which angered the, the, the Israelites. Uh, and all of those uh, constituted the external factor that um, uh, came in to uh, sort of become a force uh, against Obote. As Obote's problems were piling one after another, a sad incident occurred. The death of Kawaka Mutesa, November 21st, 1969, in his Bamos Day, Rosalite Flat, East London. Although British police identified his death as suicide, Many people believe that he died of alcohol poisoning as an assassination by agents of Obote regime who force-fed him vodka. Joyce Simpanga was in exile in London then and was one of the many Baganda who never abandoned the Kawaka. He was living at the mercy of friends. They had lent him a flat. Uh, the British government had refused to give him a job. His own regiment wanted to take him back and the government said no because Uganda government is going to take it badly. He was living in a flat in Bamos, eh? not the best part of London, but he was okay. He had Katende and he had another boy helping him. And he would have enough food. <laughs> and we used to go and see him. But we used as a community to celebrate his birthday just as we would celebrate it this way. And I think that heartened him because we never abandoned him. One, of course, one of the controversial incidents is that he was poisoned by a woman who had been sent to him. Yeah, that we believed. And we still believe. Before that woman came, somebody wrote to us, they have prepared to send a girl, her name is Tatu Sekanyo. Then in another letter, which they had posted from Nairobi, they said, we sent you a letter of warning. We are sending you now the photograph of that girl. Katende had started working because he had a family and we had no money to give him. So he used to leave the Kabaka and go and work and come back later. When he comes back, he found there was uh, there were two glasses. So he knew the Kabaka had had a guest during his absence. But of course, it would have been rude of him to ask, who did you have? She just put away the glasses. Then somebody comes to take the Kabaka through the the program of the official birthday on Saturday and he goes. Then as Katende is washing up, a telephone rings. And the Kabaka never answered the telephone. Katende went to answer it but found the Kabaka had fallen down there. But quickly being a soldier, he first attended one. He said, who are you? I'm, I'm looking for my friend. So is she there? He said she's not here and put it back. Then I attended to the Kabaka and the Kabaka was, had gone actually. So he rings his daughter, doctor, his doctor was not there. Then he rings him, Panga, what do I do? Panga said, no ring Richard Kagom because he's nearer. He will do something. Richard Kagom brings his own doctor. But by the time they got here, the Kabaka was dead. And then this girl stupidly makes a remark when she comes in the morning. At the time I rang, 
whoever answered the telephone was in such a hurry. Is that the time he died? Mm. So you ask why was she interested? But anyway, when news started going around, the boys were saying, we know that girl came with a mission, we know that girl came with a mission. But then she came to the Rumbe, you know we have the Rumbe. She came to the Rumbe, I was there and what. Then she goes to her home and she rings me and says, Mchala Mpanga, Abalenziwa gamba mbunze na seka baka, kakati baga la kuunkuba. Nimkant, if you didn't, why do you worry? The British government set up, um, I think a, a, an inquiry or whatever, maybe a doctor's whatever. And I gather the, the, the doctor said, oh, the Kabaka died as a result of alcohol. Now here is my attitude. attitude. Alcohol, the Kabaka had been taking alcohol for some time, even in Mango here. Why did he die? I go and say it was cumulative all that time. Recently I asked a doctor in Mlago here, I said it could not have been. The Kabaka's body was subsequently interred in London with all the military honours befitting a senior officer in the Grenadier Regiment. On the 19th of December 1969, while leaving the UPC delegates' conference venue at Ulgogo Indoor Stadium, Milton Obote cheated death when an assassin's bullet tore through his jaw, injuring him in the lips, tongue and teeth. I was walking with him from the conference. At, uh, after the, at the conclusion of the conference, towards uh, the exit and to our cars. But just as we got out, a uh, uh, shot rang out. Immediately we, pu we pushed uh, the president down to, f to the floor. We didn't know at that time that the uh, they had also th thrown a grenade which didn't explode. But eventually one of the bodyguards and, uh, pulled uh, the president to the nearest car that was available to rush him to, out of danger. And I actually jumped in the vice president's car, Babika's car, mm. at the time, to chase uh, the president's car which was heading to the hospital. That's where, uh, of course, we found that he had been shot through the mouth. And it was actually there that the nurse also asked me, he said, I didn't know that, well, what is this blood on your shirt? And I realized I had uh, a drop of, uh, my, the bullet had grazed my neck. There was a lot of speculations about the plotters of the failed assassination and a number of suspects were arrested. The police zeroed on one Mohammed Seba Duka together with other alleged plotters. They were charged and sent to Zera Maximum Prison. Actually nobody knows who carried out the assassination, the, the attempted assassination. Although of course the press recently, uh, about six years ago I saw in the press that there was one person who was claiming to have made the assassination attempt, uh, he, that he was a Muganda. And, uh, yeah, until uh, the, the press recently, about four or five years ago, actually claimed to have had an interview with him uh, and that uh, he's still around. Uh, but then the others seemed to suspect Amin. And actually, Bote at one time wrote that the way Amin behaved after that attempt uh, made him suspect that he could have had a hand in it. The political situation under Obote continued to deteriorate, and after an attempt on his life, Obote's government banned the opposition parties, arrested 10 of their leaders, and imposed a state of emergency. Uganda was subsequently declared a one-party state in 1969, leaving the UPC as the only legal party. Certainly it was a trend on the African continent uh, to try and uh, uh, put out other political parties, the first independent leaders, never believed in multipartism. They believed in a strong uh, political party 
that hard to define the, the, the best interests of the country, of their respective countries and, and the people. What is unique about those leaders is that in, uh, in uh, fizzling um, multi-party uh, 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 politics and clamping down on other parties, there was nothing pecuniary, nothing personal. Huh? They, didn't, they didn't use those positions in order to acquire, to amass, you know. They simply believed that they are the ones who knew the best interests of the people, all right. And anybody who tried to divert them, you know, was uh, diverting, was sabotaging you know, achieving the interests of, those, of the country. And of course, um, the, that power, the, being in power. On the 26th January 1970, the Deputy Army Commander and Commander of the 2nd Infantry Brigade Masaka, Brigadier Pierino Okoya, and Acholi was murdered together with his wife at their home in Gulu. Okoya's death was never thoroughly investigated. O Okoya was a brilliant young um soldier and uh, I think th there was like internal competition and uh, Obote was grooming him, uh, he, he was confident in him, they were these young soldiers that had come from uh, training out and, uh, 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 and Obote was entrusting them. His mother complicated the relationship between Amin and Obote. Okoya had earlier criticized Amin for fleeing the military base instead of taking charge of the army following the 1969 attempted assassination. Oh, Amin suspected that he was now looking more towards his own people, uh, the, the Okoyas and all that. Now, towards the end of 1970, the division and discontent within the army was increasingly getting clearer evident. The organizational grievances of the army and the ethnic division within the army, for example, the regime's failure to consult on the policy matters and promotions, the downgrading of the army in favor of the general service unit and Obote's alleged discrimination against West Nile and Acholi officers in favor of the Lange officers. After disagreement with Buganda, and therefore Buganda withdrawing his support from him, he, I think, looked for another base, the military. And I, I think he got convinced that uh, once he had the military behind him, then the additional political support would just uh, add uh, a little bit. But the main thing was get control of them. But in his attempt to take control, Obote did not only over accentuate tribalism, but also realized that he had created himself a monster in Idi Amin. Idi Amin. Uh, was also trying to consolidate uh, his faction within the, the Yame, and Obote was uh, also trying to consolidate the, uh, the Luo faction within the Yame. Uh, and uh, I mean, although they were together in 66, 67, increasingly became aware that uh, he was, uh, th th there was some mistrust. President Obote first responded by attempting to put Amin under house arrest. And when this failed to work, Obote then contented himself with reducing Amin's powers and made changes in the structure of the military, entrenching officers loyal to him. Obote had to deal with the senior officers from the Acholi ethnic group, who by their own right, because of their long service, were in command positions and senior staff positions. His ultimate aim, obviously, was to bring in the Lani, his own tribesmen, into command and strategic command positions. But how could he do it? He first had to deal with the, the Acholi officer, commander, the, 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 the command, uh, officers in the command positions before he could bring in those from his own tribe. 
In January 1971, the Commonwealth Heads of Government Chogum Conference was held in Singapore. Although Obote had hesitated about going to Singapore because of the obvious uncertain situations in Uganda, somehow by persuasion from other African leaders of the need to offer solidarity in the fight against Prime Minister Edward Heath's policy towards apartheid, he decided to attend. Before leaving for Singapore, Obote had demanded that on his return, Amin should provide explanations about the disappearance of arms, army overspending, unauthorized aid to Anyanya rebels, and the murder of Brigadier Okoya. This indirectly meant an order for Amin's arrest. Obote, on his departure, well, before his departure for uh, a Commonwealth meeting in Singapore, uh, January uh, 71, left instructions that Idi Amin this time should be arrested and put away before he came back. Idi Amin picked this and he made his strategic plans to counter if anything like that happened. And indeed, the instructions to carry out this order were put to, 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 to execution in the barracks of Lubiri, known as Malire at that time. As the commanding officer was giving out his orders to deploy troops so that he could move to arrest Idi Amin that day, that evening, Idi Amin moved faster with his own troops. He took over the government. Advocating for civilian... Henry Chamber, then Principal Private Secretary to the President, was with Obote in Singapore. The late Chris Intent, who was Permanent Secretary in Internal Affairs, came. And because there was no room in the hotel, he stayed with me in my room. And later we left my room to go and have a word with the President. So by the morning of our departure from Singapore, uh, the President called everybody and told us that things were a bit, a bit rough in Kampala, but uh, things would be all right. So we went to the airport and took off, uh, basically for Delhi and for Nairobi. As we were airborne, uh, the BBC was the only source of information, and I was always going to the cockpit to interact with the pilots as the latest developments. The news came that... Uh, but had been overthrown. So I went back to the compartment to relay the news to him. I said, Mr. President, you have, uh, I mean, has, has taken over. And uh, we took it from there with, the, with everybody on board. Obata was keen to get to Nairobi as soon as possible. But it so happened that uh, Kenyatta wasn't very keen about intervening on his behalf. He wished, uh, but hadn't gone there. Uh, and uh, but having spoken to Nyerere and being a member of the Mulungish Club, uh, Nyerere was very uh, happy to host him in Dar es Salaam. So we stayed in Nairobi only one night, and the following morning, all of us, even those who didn't want to go, had to fly to. Dar es Salaam, where the reception was very different. News of Obote's deposition brought Kampala people cheering into the streets, strewing green branches before army vehicles, drinking and dancing with troops. Troops fired celebration volleys into the air. Despite the fact that Amin had led the attack on Kabaka's palace at Mengo, the Baganda welcomed the coup. To them, the change of government opened the possibility of restoring the Kabaka ship. I think this is simple psychology. Someone, hurt, someone you know, hurts you, the other guy who gets him out of the way, you clap for him. Amin immediately released 55 of the 93 political detainees, including outspoken monarchists and the five cabinet ministers arrested in 1966. The three presidential residents were searched and a large number of cache of arms was found. Amin alleged that it had been Obote's stockpile for use to kill senior army officers, including Idi Amin himself. 
Now, a broadcast on Radio Uganda by an army officer accused President Obote and his regime of corruption, suppressing democracy and failing to maintain law and order. He also alleged the former president had insulated Uganda from Kenya and Tanzania, and perhaps most significantly, of trying to divide the army and put his fellow land tribesmen in the most senior army and government posts. On February the 2nd, 1971, Amin was sworn in as military head of state. Holding the Quran in his right hand, he took the oath of allegiance, swearing to serve all the people of Uganda without fear or favor or ill will. Then, one by one, 14 of his 17 ministers, holding the book of their respective faiths, promised to serve the republic truly and well at all times. General Amin said he was a soldier, not a politician and the military government would be a caretaker regime until new elections. The elections date would be announced as soon as the situation was normal. In the real sense of the word, the 1971 coup was executed not by institutionally aggrieved officers and soldiers, but by Amin and his supporters to forestall Amin's imminent arrest, and not by any real desire as he asserted to save his country from Obote. In our next episode, we take a look at Amin's first five years, the expulsion of Asians, the collapse of the economy, the futile invasion by Ugandan dissidents from Tanzania, and the state-sponsored killings. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.